rock and roll now. So my name is Dr. Rachel Baumsteiger. Um, I have expertise in positive developmental psychology. All right. Um, so before we get started, I just want to mention that um, I put some mental health resources below. So if you are struggling with mental health issues, I recommend that you check out Cal Poly's resources. They have really excellent services um, and look outside of Cal Poly if you'd like. Um, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and begin. All right, so I want to start off by asking you, what do you think of when I say happiness? So if you are online, feel free to um, throw it in the chat in person, you can yell it out if you want, or just kind of think to yourself. <laughs> think of when you think of happiness. Cats, thank you. <laughs> A lot of people think of um, things having to do, oh, I see another genuine life satisfaction. Yes, thank you, Pauline. Yeah, so when we think of happiness, a lot of people, at least I do, think of people who are smiling and laughing and um, filled with joy. And that's definitely part of what we think of as happiness. But that's really the kind of short term, momentary um, happiness. We also can think of happiness as being having a sense of meaning and pride and feeling good about where your life is going, um, feeling like you're interested in the things you're doing, you're creating something good in the world. And you're having good relationships with other people. Um, so there can be kind of the short-term fleeting moments of happiness, of joy and laughter and all of that. Um, but we can also think of it as a kind of broader long-term feeling um, that life is going well. So I'll be talking about some strategies for promoting all of those. And I'll try to be specific about which facet of well-being or happiness I'm talking about. Um, so why I promote happiness? I probably don't need to convince you because you're here. Um, but we value happiness for its own sake. If you ask people what they want out of life, many people will say, I want to be happy, right? So this is kind of an end and of itself. But in addition, in case anyone was worried that that wasn't enough, um, we know that when people are experiencing positive emotions, they're actually more likely to be open to building new relationships with people, um, taking out new classes, signing up for new workshops to kind of build out their skill set. So we see this kind of upward spiral when it comes to happiness of being able to be open and effective in lots of other ways. We also see that happiness and things like relationships contribute to resiliency or the ability to bounce back from things and endure challenging times. And we see that happiness is related to health, physical health and longevity. So if you want to live longer and live healthier, uh, happiness actually does contribute to that. So a big question then is if we want to promote happiness, is that something that's even possible? So there is a debate in the field about to what extent can we actually increase our happiness levels? And there is some research to suggest that we do to at least some extent have kind of a set point or set range at least of happiness levels. So for example, if you think about something that most people would expect would lead to a big bump in happiness. Some people would say winning the lottery, that would do it for me. I would be happy <laughs> for the rest of my life. But there's actually studies that have looked at people who have won the lottery and they happened to ask them about their happiness levels before and then after. And they found that there was an initial bump of joy, as you can imagine, from winning the lottery. But when they came back just a few months later, they had returned back to about where they were before. So there is some, some evidence to support this idea that uh, a lot of things don't actually change our happiness levels. However, there is also evidence on the other side that show that there are certain things that can change your happiness levels for the better or for the worse. And when it comes to intentional activities to increase our happiness, the things that are, what's really important is that we're trying to, we're doing things that are sustained. They're ongoing changes to our patterns. So we're changing what we're doing on a daily basis, not just going to one workshop or doing one activity, uh, having one interaction, something that you have to kind of work at over time. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about five major types of practices today. 
Um, and because we got a little bit of a late start, I think I'm just kind of going to roll through these, but please stop me at any time if you have questions. And hopefully we have a little bit of time at the end for a Q and A um, and some discussion. So the five categories of practices I'm going to talk about are first, maintaining good physical health, cultivating good thoughts or mindsets, fostering good relationships, finding, engaging in meaningful work, and having more enjoyable experiences. And I believe we will share the slides afterwards, so don't feel like you need to jot everything. Okay, um, so again, stop me if you have questions at any point. I'm going to start with physical health. So there, I'm gonna use a really scientific word here, there's oodles of evidence to show that there is a strong connection between physical health and mental health. So the more that you take care of your physical health, the more happiness you will have. And these are just, I put a few examples of citations at the bottom studies that have shown this, but there are so many. So this is really well supported. Um, you all probably have a good idea of what it means to have healthy behaviors, but just as an overview, I'm talking about sleep. Something that's difficult for college students, I know, is to get enough sleep, um, but it's really important for your well being. Uh, diet, so having enough nutrients in your diet, drinking enough water, and then also moving around. So getting enough exercise, and there's lots of different kinds of exercises and they have different benefits, but bottom line is moving at some point, right? So find something that you do like if you're someone who says, you know, I don't really like exercise a lot, find something you'll like. Um, so I can't pretend that I'm an expert in this area, but I put a link at the bottom of this slide that has um, some really good resources for kind of the up-to-date recommendations in terms of health practices. On the flip side, we want to also stay away from unhealthy behaviors. So these include things like not eating a healthy diet, um, not moving around, so having a sedentary lifestyle, that's something I know I struggle with because my work is mostly sitting on a computer all day. So it's important to move around. Um, smoking, drinking, drugs, and chronic stress. So again, I know this is probably not earth shattering news to you that these things also are linked to happiness. Um, but if you are looking for something to do that really is going to truly increase your happiness levels, I would probably recommend starting here. So for example, adding a short walk, the beginning of the day, end of the day, middle of the day, that's something that can actually make a difference in how you feel. So just want you to think to yourself, what is a small thing that you can do? I mean, some people are living perfectly healthy lives. I know a couple of people who are stellar at this, but a lot of us could make some small changes to be a little bit healthier. So that's one thing I encourage you to think about. Another thing um, which was on that list of unhealthy things, but is especially relevant for college students is stress. So first I want to distinguish between, there's, there's two major types of stress. Um, one is acute stress. And this is what happens when you are going for a job interview or maybe a first date or some sort of situation where um, you are really nervous in the moment. And this is actually pretty adaptive. Um, it leads us to be paying attention and awake. Um, if there is some sort of threat, we are paying attention and attuned to it, ready to act. We find that acute stress is actually pretty normal as long as it's not your stress levels don't go so high that you then run away from the job interview. <laughs> um, but this isn't really that problematic because it's kind of part of normal life that we get nervous in certain situations. However, what we want to look out for is chronic stress. So chronic stress is ongoing stress. So this is where we see people experiencing stress on a daily basis. Oftentimes it's because of a stressful work environment or signing up for too many classes in the semester um, or having someone around you who is really um, not contributing to your well being. So, in these situations, you might consider one thing that you can do is try to manage the stress that you already have. And we can do that through things like exercise, as I just mentioned. There's a really strong connection between exercise and stress reduction. Um, and then some other things that we'll talk about in a minute include things like having a positive outlook, um, having good relationships, and then experiencing positive emotions. So for example, laughter really helps to undo the effects of stress. 
But in addition to managing stress, I would also encourage people to think about how can we set up life to not have as much stress? So there's some things we can't get rid of, right? We can't fix, but there might be some things that we can. And this can be difficult because in our society, we're taught to really go, 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 achieve, achieve. As students, you know, there's a lot of pressure to get good grades and make a good impression on people. Um, but are there certain elements of your life that you could take out to just give yourself a little bit more time and put a little bit less pressure? I want to share a story with you that I think gets at this that has really I heard it years ago and it really stuck with me. Um, so I'll go ahead and read this to you. An American businessman, Woody, was at the pier of a small Mexican village when a boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the boat were many pounds of large gulf shrimp. The American complimented the fisherman on the quality of his catch and asked about the mesh of his cast net. Why is the mesh so, so large? Couldn't you catch more with a tighter weave? Hector, the fisherman replied, I catch what I need, senor. And the net, the net is a fine net. I was taught how to weave this net by my father. It was taught by his father. I work on the net every day to keep it strong. Woody then asked how long it took for his catch. Hector replied, only a little while. The American questioned, so what do you do with the rest of your time? The fisherman said, I sleep late, I pray, I play with my children, take a siesta with my wife and stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. On Sundays, I go to mass and spend the rest of the day with La Familia. I have a full and busy life, senor, I am very happy. After hearing the fisherman's account of this week, Woody scoffed said, I am a Harvard MBA and can help you be more successful. You should use a net smaller weave and spend more time fishing. And with the proceeds by a bigger boat with the larger net, you could troll for many miles. With the profits of the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually you'd have a fleet of boats. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor and then open your own plant. You could control the product, product processing and distribution. You would need to leave the small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then Houston, then Los Angeles. There you would run your extent, expanding enterprise. Hector was somewhat taken aback by the complicated plan and said, but senor, how long would this take? Woody replied, 15 to 20 years. But then what, senor? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You would make millions. Million, senor? Then what? Hector questioned. The American said, then you would retire, move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, pray, fish a little, play with your grandkids, take a siesta with your life, wife, stroll into the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and spend time with La Familia. So the idea here is, you know, maybe we don't need to be going so fast and so hard all the time. And we can take more time to kind of slow down and appreciate what we do have in life and not try not to feel so fearful all the time and so rushed into things, kind of make life a little simpler. And I hope that story kind of hits some of you the same way it hit me. Um, so again, my main point here is we, we do have lots of ways we can manage stress, but I also encourage you to try to figure out, can you set up your world so it's not as stressful? Maybe you can do that to a certain extent. All right, moving on. Next, I wanna talk about thoughts and mindsets. So we know we can't control everything in the external world, but something that we do have a lot of control over is what happens in our internal world. So all of these things kind of fall into that bucket. And I'm definitely not going over everything today, by the way, um, just kind of picking and choosing some things that I think are useful. All right, so one practice that you can use in your daily life is called savoring. So if anyone in here has ever had a delicious meal before and just had that moment where you just sit there and, ah, this is so good, that's what savoring is. And we can do that with things besides food as well. Um, so it's really about noticing and appreciating what's, what you're experiencing in the moment. And we can increase how much we savor by looking for these kinds of experiences that give us that pleasure in the moment by looking forward to things. So if we're planning a vacation, for example, let yourself be excited and take time to sit in that excitement. And afterwards, it's really fun sometimes to look back on pictures, for example, and show people, tell them about it, 
it's another way you can kind of hang on to those good feelings. Um, and then when you're actually in that moment, experiencing the things that you're on vacation, try to really be there. So be mindful, be paying attention to how you're feeling in the moment. And this goes along with a practice that you've probably heard before called mindfulness. Um, I really like this picture because this helps me understand it really quickly. Um, so on the left, you see uh, the human's mind, which is full of other thoughts. And on the right, you see the dog's mind, which is probably just thinking, oh, we're in a park. It's beautiful. That's it. Um, so being mindful is really about kind of being present in the moment, being engaged and paying attention to what's happening. We see that this is associated with positive affect, so pleasant emotions, as well as kind of our long-term indices of um, life satisfaction. So when you do this regularly, um, it does make you feel like you are getting more enjoyment out of life. So one question I have for you, um, and if you're watching this after the fact, we have a recording, you might pause here and think, how can you savor more in life? What are the experiences where you could be more in the moment? Okay, for time, I'm moving on though. <laughs> so um, next up, a really uh, well-studied strategy for improving happiness is to practice gratitude. Get rid of this. No. Okay, um, so gratitude is about appreciating uh, people around you and what they've done for you and all the good things that you have in your life. Um, so this is, again, really strongly linked to happiness levels. Uh, it makes people feel good in the moment, but also leads them to um, have less stress and then for better physical health. Um, it also is associated with stronger relationships. So one really simple practice that you can do um, is called the three good things. So the idea is that you take a moment in your day to write down three good things in your life. And the point is that this is really a short activity. It doesn't take too long and it doesn't have to be huge things, right? It can be small things like um, I stopped and got a coffee today and it tasted really good. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts doesn't always, it's not very consistent, but today they were on the mark. So I was happy about that. Um, you can do this through writing, but you can also do this through talking with people. So maybe it's on the way to school in the morning if you write in with someone, um, or, or maybe it's something you do by yourself, just in your mind. Um, the actual writing isn't as important as you just getting in the habit of having this mindset. And doing it just for a couple minutes a day does get you thinking about it more throughout your day. All right, so, so far I've talked about when things are going well and how to focus in and really try to make the most of that, but sometimes things don't go so well, right? So maybe you do something embarrassing or something you feel guilty about. In those moments, one thing you can do is try to zoom out, right? So I always picture, for some reason, my old self, I always picture sitting on a bench swing and looking back at my life thinking, am I really going to care that much that I turned in that assignment five minutes late? or that I tripped in front of everyone in class? No, right? That doesn't super matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, so this is called psychological distancing. It's a tactic that's really effective at helping people to reduce the anxiety you feel um, when things aren't going well, because it really puts it in kind of the bigger picture of your life. Another important strategy is called self-compassion. And the main idea here is that we try to treat uh, ourselves like we treat others. So if someone else does something wrong or they make a mistake, they do something clumsy, we don't say, oh, you're so stupid. How could you do that? Right. But we do often do that to ourselves. People often really beat themselves up over things that, again, they would just give a lot of acceptance, forgiveness and grace to other people for. So the idea of self-compassion is really just be kinder to yourself and recognize that you're a human and it's OK if, if you make a mistake. Gonna pause for one second. Um, that's again. All right. So next, I'm going to shift to mindsets. Um, this is something that's been a hot topic in education. So you might have heard of it before. Um, but when we see a challenge or something that we're not good at at first, some people see that as kind of the end of the end of the story. Like I'm not good at it. I can't do it. That's it. And we call that a fixed mindset. It's this belief that our abilities 
such as intelligence, are set in stone. We can't change them. On the other hand, you can think more about how you can improve over time. And we call this a growth mindset. We say, no, I'm not good at it now, but I can put in some time and effort and get better. And this is important because it's one of my old group fitness instructors used to say, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. I think that's actually a Ben Franklin quote. I'll be getting that wrong. <laughs> Famous quote from someone. Um, the idea is if, if you say, I can't do it, that's it, right? You don't try anymore and you really can't. But if you say, you know what? Maybe I can. And you try at it and you persist, take on new challenges, have failures, but keep going, then maybe someday you can do it. And we do see that people with a growth mindset are more likely to take on challenges and work through things and therefore are more likely to experience feelings of pride and success. If anyone's ever, this happens in the gym all the time, done something where you couldn't do it one day and then you could the next day after you worked it, it's the best feeling ever, right? So this is something that uh, having this growth mindset is really helpful for leading you to feel those uh, to, to both grow in terms of your skills and to experience those pleasant feelings of having gotten better at something. Uh, next, I'm talking about de making decisions. This is one of my favorite things that I've learned about um, within positive psych. And I'll tell you why in a moment. So having different options for things, think good or bad, if you were, say, going to order lunch or pick out an outfit, do you want to have more options or less? I'm seeing some um, hand motions here. So having choices is generally good. We want to have options, right? But there's a big caveat here. Having too many options can actually lead people to feel anxious. And then after they make the decision, to regret those decisions. Um, there's this uh, term called decision fatigue that comes about from making a lot of decisions, which is part of it. Part of it is also um, kind of your personal style of how you make decisions. So there's this interesting distinction between there's some people um, who Schwartz and colleagues call maximizers. Um, the reason I like this distinction is it really speaks to me. I, I'll admit, I'm a maximizer. This is someone who sees options and says, I have to choose the very best one. So if you, for example, are um, going to lunch and you see a menu, you're, I'm like, I have to read every single option and then make a very careful calculated choice <laughs> of what I'm, maybe I need to look at pictures. I need to see reviews. I can't just choose. Other people, he says, our satisficers, they pick an option that's good enough. So they might look at a menu and say, you know, I'll give it a scan, but then something will jump out to me and I'll just go with that. And I'll be good enough. It doesn't, I don't need to and agonize over making the absolute best decision. Do you want to have a guess of which one is better? <laughs> For happiness? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because on the one hand, maximizers actually tend to get better outcomes in the end. If you look at something like what kind of house you want, maximizers tend to get the better deal, but it comes at a price. So they tend to have a lot more anxiety when they're making decisions and then experience more regret after the fact. So what we can take away from this, regardless of which way you are, um, the main tips is Decide when it's important to make a really good choice. So maybe if you're looking at buying a house, it's a big commitment. Maybe you do actually want to deliberate over that, right? That merits a lot of time. But if you're deciding what outfit to wear in the morning or what like flavor coffee to get, maybe that's not such a big deal. You don't need to agonize over everything. Another um, kind of set of recommendations is if you're making a choice, to try to narrow it down. So you can uh, say, hide half of the menu. Maybe I go in and I'm going to brunch. I'm like, you know what? I know I want something in the like scramble category. So I'm not even gonna look at everything else, right? So trying to limit the options or limit how much time you're going to put into a decision or try to minimize how many decisions you're making in a day. And this is where um, there are some people who have become famous for wearing the same shirt every day. This is where this comes in, trying to minimize decisions. 
Um, and then another thing that's important is to be grateful for what you have. So when you've made a decision, try to then be happy with what it is that you have made the choice with and not um, kind of go back and forth about what could have been. All right. Next, I'm moving on to relationships. So relationships may be the most important thing for well-being, depending on who you ask. Lots of people are in that camp. Um, so there's lots of different kinds of relationships. I know when this comes up, we usually just think about romantic relationships, but you can also think of mentors and friends, neighbors, community members. So each of these types of relationships contribute to different needs, right? So some people might be the ones you have fun with. Some might be the people you split expenses with, right? Um, some people might be ones that you are procreating and child rearing with, right? There are lots of different people and they kind of contribute in different ways. They bring a lot to our lives. Um, and overall healthy relationships is one of the biggest predictors of overall happiness, both in the moment and long-term. Um, so again, this is an area where I just put a couple, just put some examples of studies that have found this, but there's lots more backwards. But note that I underlined here, healthy relationships. Unhealthy relationships do not have these benefits. So when we think about happiness, what we really want to look to foster is quality relationships over having a lot of them. And in fact, the older we get, we tend to have fewer relationships because we're more focused on really putting our time and energy into the ones that are serving us and letting go of the ones that are not. So this is something we become more skilled at as we grow older. So I feel like anytime I talk about relationships, I have to put up warning flags. So there's lots of neutral relationships that you might have or ones that just aren't serving and contributing to your happiness. But there are also some that might be actively detracting. So I just wanna share some warning signs um, just in case you or someone you know might experience this. So some warning signs of a really unhealthy relationship is that you feel bad about yourself, feel pressured to change who you are, feel pressured to quit activities that you used to like, you kind of neglect yourself to try to take care of someone else, a partner tries to control you, criticizes, you feel the need to justify yourself, um, and of course, if there are emotional outbursts or physical violence. And there's a lot more information. Um, if you're interested, this domestic abuse hotline, it's not like you call and all of a sudden people like show up at your house. You can call and just ask for information about things to look out for or if you're, you think, oh, I have a friend who might be in a relationship that might not be so good. You can call and just talk to them about options. So if you, you or someone else is in that situation, I encourage you to do that. All right, so then healthy relationships. I'm going to summarize a ton of literature all at once on what makes it un makes a healthy relationship. So one of the first people to study relationships is looking at parent-child relationships. This was Harlow. Um, some of you might be familiar with his monkey studies. He found that physical contact is really important, at least in the parent-child relationship. Um, Ainsworth and Bowlby also did a lot of work with um, infants and parents and talked about um, how much, how responsive people are. And it turns out that this continues to be really important later on in life in romantic relationships too. All right, so uh, another interesting theory is the equity theory, um, which is basically saying that both people are putting in and getting out good things in the relationship and that that should be somewhat equal. So it's not like one person is putting in all this time and effort and one person is barely putting in anything. There should be some equity in those things. Uh, Gottman also did a lot of research on um, positive to negative interactions. He has this golden ratio of five to one. He says, for every one negative interaction, uh, you really need to have five positive ones. And based on that ratio, he observed couples. And um, for people who passed that ratio, versus people who didn't pass the ratio, he could predict with 90% accuracy whether they were still together when he came back years later. So something to the amount of positive interactions. Uh, we also know that self-disclosure is important, sharing something about yourself. Um, having contact that's positive, but also at least somewhat frequent. 
Uh, Shelly Gable does a lot of work on what's called capitalizing, which is when you make the most out of each other's good news. Um, and then there's a whole kind of body of research on what's called relationship minding, which brings a lot of this research together, but adds things like um, really you want to make positive attributions about the other person. So basically giving them the benefit of the doubt is important or um, self-expansion is important. So trying out each other's activities or taking an interest, asking them about their work, even though that's something that's not necessarily your interest, kind of making yourself a part of their world. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, another really tried and tested activity is to express gratitude. There's a gratitude letter activity that's on a website I'll share at the end of this um, that has been shown to be really effective. But the, uh, the general idea of just taking a moment to tell someone how much you appreciate them is really effective in boosting both their happiness levels and your own. People usually feel really good after doing this. So if you're looking for one just like quick takeaway thing that you could do today, um, you could pick someone in your life and say thank you. Um, so again, if you're watching online later, maybe you could pause this moment in the video and think about something you could do um, to foster your relationships. All right, next up I wanna talk about work. Um, so I wanna say work doesn't necessarily have to be the most like fulfilling, exciting thing in your life. Lots of people go to work because they need to earn money and it's not their favorite thing in the world, but at the end of the day, they go home and then they have lots of leisure and great relationships. And they're like, you know what? It gives me a paycheck, I have security, um, whatever. It doesn't need to be something that's thrilling, but it really is nice if you enjoy work. <laughs> it's great if you go in and you're like actually interested in what you're doing. Um, so you say the biggest uh, predictor of job satisfaction is intrinsic motivation, which is the idea that you are doing something because you want to do it. Because you feel proud or interested, curious, rather than trying to look for um, external rewards like money or grades or someone else cheering you on. So you could be doing the same activity for two different reasons, right? You could be playing soccer because you want to get a trophy, you want applause, or you could be doing it because you like it, right? And we see that if you're doing it for internal reasons, you're probably more likely to be um, satisfied with that. Um, so in thinking about what you're intrinsically motivated to do, you might think of, consider these questions. So what are some things that make you smile? What do you enjoy? What activities make you lose track of time? What are you naturally good at? Who inspires you and why? So what are the qualities that you admire in other people? And if you could change anything about the world, what would it be? What would you want to fix? I wanna zoom in on one of these things, which is losing track of time. So there's a, a theory of flow that was created by Mike Csikszentmihalyi. I had the immense pleasure of learning from him at the Claremont Graduate University. Um, he did a lot of work on trying to understand peak activities, experiences where people say they had, they really enjoyed it, they learned a lot from it. And he looked, he started actually talking to mountain climbers. And they said, you know, the whole day would just fly by because they were so focused on what they were doing. And he called this state flow. He says, we say this all the time, I was in the zone. I didn't even notice that you walked behind me because I was so into whatever I was doing. I get this with writing. Um, some people get it with physical things, artistic things, um, experience it in a lot of different activities, but we tend to experience it as something that's um, really pleasurable after the fact. We're not really thinking about it in the moment because we're so focused on that thing, but afterwards people say that felt really good and also leads to a lot of productivity. So the, the key to flow is having the right mix of challenge and skill. So you want to find something that's somewhat challenging, but not so much that you become frustrated. And so um, some key you know, strategies for getting into flow include picking activities that you know lead to flow, right? That you find yourself um, getting sucked into. And if you have something that is kind of boring, you can actually make that a flow activity by making it more challenging. 
Um, I, for example, hate folding my laundry. I find it so boring. But what I try to do, um, Mike actually taught me this one, is I try to put on, I find some sort of video on YouTube and I'm like, can I fold it by the time this video is done? Mm -hmm. And then I'm, and then I have a great time. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you just need to make it a little harder. Um, in terms of a lot of people, you can use this with studying and writing. Um, the big thing you want to do is create an environment where you can really focus and you don't have distractions. Um, and you get better with practice. So this is something that is really great to experience at work. If you can swing a career where you are experiencing this on a daily basis, um, people tend to be much more satisfied with their jobs. But it's also something you can experience with leisure, right? So um, there's lots of activities that could get you into flow that are outside of your career. All right. So lastly, I'm going to move on to kind of my other bucket here, other activities. One that goes along with flow is creativity. So there's this kind of longstanding notion that people who are creative are must be suffering from something. But we find that creativity is often associated with happiness. Being able to express your creativity leads people to feel proud of themselves, to feel a sense of accomplishment, um, and to feel like they're doing something worthwhile. There's lots of things I just want to mention. I always think, oh, I'm not a creative person, right? Because I'm not artistic. But there's lots of different ways to be creative. For example, cooking can be a creative activity. Um, you could create a phone app. I find teaching to be creative because I like to try to do lots of activities. Um, one of my friends recently started making uh, board games as gifts for people, which he really enjoys, gets really into. So um, if you're interested, also, Cal Poly has a creativity innovation lab on campus where they have lots of tools like a 3D printer that you can use for free as students. It's a really cool place. So if you're interested in kind of be, having more creative time, uh, I recommend checking that out. We also know that play is really valuable. Um, it's fun in the moment, but it also is valuable because it undoes a lot of those um, feelings of stress and all the effects of stress on our bodies. Going along with that, humor is something that evokes amusement and laughter. That is really useful too. So I'm saying this more to give you um, a justification to try to spend more time <laughs> working this into your lives. Um, so we see that there, there is kind of what we call adaptive humor, which is kind of good natured, making fun of yourselves or others, but light and fun. Um, there is maladaptive humor. So um, when people, people can use humor in an aggressive way. And in that case, it is not associated with happiness. Um, it's really more if you're trying to use it to connect with people and make light of things. Of course, humor and play often leads to laughter. And we, we know that laughter is so good for physical health, but also overall well-being. A lot of that has to do, interestingly, with you get a deep belly laugh. It leads to different like, blood flow. It's really interesting. So a lot of physiological effects. So laughter is legitimately something that contributes to well-being. I also think it's just intuitive that we're all like, yeah, who doesn't love to laugh, right? <laughs> having a good time. Um, so if you're stressed out about something, it does actually pay off to take, take a break, so maybe spend it with friends or watch something funny um, so you can get more of the effects of laughter. All right, my research is on pro-social behavior, which is essentially helping. And there's so many ways that you can help someone else and it has so many benefits. So it obviously benefits the other person who's receiving help um, and it benefits the larger groups to have a sense of trust and camaraderie, but also benefits you. So people often say it makes them feel good in the moment and also gives them a sense of meaning and like I'm doing something good in the world. So if you're ever feeling really down, um, one recommendation I make is just find a way to help someone else. And it doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, volunteering or a big behavior. It could be doing a chore for someone you know that they don't like to do or even gifting something to someone, you know, doing anything to kind of advance the welfare of others. Um, and then this is my last one, I think. Uh, <laughs> we know that being in nature, just uh, kind of by my own experience, it's nice, right? People often say, oh, it's such a nice day to be outside. Um, but we know that scientifically, it's been shown to also increase our sense of relaxation, 
vitality or kind of being energetic and our kind of feeling of being connected more broadly to the world. Um, in fact, you don't even have to go outside into nature. Even seeing a video of nature or having a picture of nature can induce these effects. So if you have an office, getting a plant or even a picture of a plant might actually help you. All right, I know we are almost at time. So I'll just encourage you to think about the kinds of experiences that you really enjoy and think about how can you do that more? So how can you schedule that into your day? For example, I love kayaking, but I end up not doing it a lot. Um, but it just takes a little bit of time to plan out. If you are interested in learning more strategies, I really recommend this site called The Greater Good in Action. And I'll put the link to it at the end of this. It has, I think there's 92 activities right now. Um, and these are all science-based. Uh, you can search by the kind of outcome you're looking for, such as connection, or if you want to work on mindfulness or um, self-compassion, or you can sort by ratings like Yelp. <laughs> you can look at the most highly rated activities. When you click on one, it shows you how to do it, how long it'll take. It shows the evidence for why it works. And if you make a login, you can also kind of create your own catalog of these. Um, so this is a really, really excellent resource. With any of these, you really are not going to see any effects unless you put an effort, especially ongoing effort. I wanna have, my final thought is actually don't chase happiness. I know you might be like, you just gave us not quite an hour, maybe 50 minutes of things to do to chase happiness. But really we find that people who obsess over happiness tend to not, tend to feel less happy. In fact, they get anxious about it. So I'd say I wouldn't recommend thinking about this constantly. What I recommend is try to take care of your physical health, have good relationships, have kind of foster those good mindsets and thoughts. And find activities within work and outside of work that you enjoy, find interesting, and that you feel meaningful. Find meaningful, and then happiness will find you. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, I listed my email. Um, and then this is the website for the Greater Good in Action Center. And then here again are the mental health resources in case anyone missed it. I know we're right at time, so, and many of you probably have to go to other things. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And, Thank you so much for coming in.